How do you talk about a favorite restaurant? Or perhaps you might, how do you talk about a restaurant that you've had bad service? I expect that a favorite restaurant is shared with enthusiasm and the power of persuasion. An interesting thing happens when we are asked to talk about something that we love, enjoy, or find meaningful. The very act of sharing it with others, our positive feelings to a, about a person, place, or thing, increases our positive feelings. Even as we are seeking to share this good thing we are testifying about with someone else. Do we talk about our faith in the same way? Do we easily share our experiences of God's love? Christ's presence in our lives, of being a part of Prairie Avenue Christian Church, of new insights into faith, or of the impact our faith has on our lives. I know we live in a world that says don't talk about two things, politics and religion, but as we have discovered with giving and sharing kindness, the same experience happens when we share our faith. We grow and deepen as we also give it away. Several people who have had the honor of serving as teachers, as Sunday school teachers, adult Sunday school teachers, or children's Sunday school teachers, share this inevitable truth that when they were involved in sharing and studying and instructing and teaching that it was their faith that grew too. A shared faith is a growing faith. When we share our faith, others discover and see and follow Christ's light that we often show. We live in a world so connected that a few clicks we can find reviews of any movie, restaurant, television show, and even a neighborhood association or business. We also live in a world where experience can be shared with anyone willing to read our reviews about it. So how does your faith in Jesus make a difference in your life? If you had to write a review what would it say? What would be the review of Jesus and you? Sadly, there are many bad and painfully truthful encounters with churches and Christians behaving awful. The world is increasingly skeptical of faith in general, but especially what is often identified as organized religion. Words associated with organized religion include hypocritical, judgmental, irrelevant, mean-spirited, anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-LGBTQ, and plus. But these cannot be seen when one looks at Jesus in scripture or the gospel he preached nor should any of this be part of the church he intended or reflect most of the christians and churches that i have encountered i have not, i certainly i have had the experience of encountering a judgmental christian but i've also found judgmental atheists but it's only a few, and it's, that's usually all it takes to paint the rest. They often make the headlines and are too often causing others to not identify as Christians. Some Christians behave so badly, it's embarrassing and shameful. You have also probably encountered a poor example of someone trying to share their faith, you know, turn or burn, or do you know where you will go if you die tonight? Now, I'll be the first to say, I'm not perfect in living out my faith. None of us are perfect in that, but we are all called by Jesus to live and share our faith in such a way that others do 
and can see him in some way in us. Most people who choose to follow Jesus do so because of the positive witness of Christians through whom they've experienced love and from whom they've heard a compelling witness and example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Our scripture reading from one of the Apostle Paul's letters describes his ministry as an ambassadorship, as Christ's representative and promoter. That's what ambassadors do. We are all representatives of Christ. And it is in our work, our habits, and our living that we either promote or prevent someone from desiring and becoming a follower of Jesus. You are truly living out a sermon without words all the time by how you are treating other people. And organized religion has always had bad and questionable ambassadors and representatives. And often Jesus himself drew religious outcasts into his inner circle as disciples. The ones that the churches of Jesus' day threw out were the ones that Jesus would include. Jesus was, after all, criticized by the religious for being a friend of sinners and tax collectors. I have a saying posted near the church office desk that says, Be like Jesus. Spend enough time with sinners to ruin your reputation with religious people. Whether he was criticized for eating at the table of Zacchaeus, an ARC tax collector, top-of-the-line tax collector, or healing the servant of a captain of a Roman legion, or the blind and the sick, where often, and it's still a stigma to this day, that illness was thought to be evidence of God's judgment or absence in others. Jesus sought and joined and walked and talked to those whom the religious crowd still, to this day, studiously and loudly avoids. Jesus is always saying them too when we want it to only be about us. It may have been perhaps reading scripture that those stories of Jesus brought you to the faith you have. The Holy Spirit indeed speaks through the record of the testimony given to us in scripture. But I suspect that it wasn't reading that your faith came to you not through those words, but rather as a person. You are a Christ follower today because the faith of someone demonstrated and revealed Christ to you. It may have been a beloved family member, a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, aunt, or it may have been a Sunday school teacher or another lay leader in your childhood or young adult church walk. Occasionally I do hear that a pastor actually did the work, although that's not usually the most common answer. I hear often a co-worker, a, a fr friend, a family member, whoever they may be, you are a follower of Christ because of their witness and love. The one who shared their faith with you may no longer be alive, departed from this life, or may be still living. And I do hope, if they are alive, that you do send them a note or Give them a phone call to let them know how much of a difference they made in their life. But here's the question I want to ask you. Are there people who would say that you played a key part in their becoming a follower of Christ? Today we have more ways to share our faith without the door knocking, the track distributing, the bullhorns, or the guilt and shame games that commonly plague evangelism. 
as social media has proven for better or worse, you can comment about anything, anyone, and any feeling at a couple of clicks of a mouse and a type. Comment positively about the sermon or the disciplines class, the prayer group you are in, or and always extend an invitation for others to come join you. You know that asking someone to join you at church, 80% of the time would get an affirmation of yes. Take a photograph of you serving or impacting your community, giving. Does your social media connections know you so well that they can actually name the church you go to on a regular basis? I'm sure many of us would say that it was probably those closest to us, our parents or grandparents, who are most responsible for us being a Christian today. Now, you may have also had those parents or grandparents that made you go to church, made you sing in the children's choir and participate in Sunday school. And I, but I bet that you are also grateful for all the made-to-go time you did spend. Is it the same for your children and your grandchildren? You perhaps did make them, and perhaps, unfortunately, now they want nothing to do with church, faith, God. You brought them up in the church, and they now just shut you down and shut you off, reveal all the shortcomings that they hear and see, not about your particular church, but churches in general, and reveal and just put you off. For some, this might be a season in their lives. And for those who strongly desire to see their children and grandchildren still yet embrace faith, it can be painful with its willful rejection. I would like to encourage you to pray daily for them. Continue to talk about your faith, not forcibly or guilt and shame thrown in in good measure, but a steadfast love that is always available whenever they are ready to perhaps make a step towards it. And you are ready and able to embrace wherever they are in life, not whenever they get their life in order. Your children's and grandchildren's stories may be a lot like Luann's. She left the church when she went off to college. And about 30 years ago, Luann's mother was fighting cancer and sent her a letter saying, Luann, you have everything a person could ever hope for. A caring husband, wonderful children, and now a grandchild, financial success, a beautiful home. Yet the one thing that is most important in life you are lacking I long and pray for you to find a church and to walk with Christ. Now, Luann received this letter and was furious, angry that her mother was once again trying to tell her what to do with her life. While she thought about throwing the letter away, she couldn't get herself to do it. She kept it. And when her mother died a few short months later, she read the letter a few more times. And then she looked and started attending a church and became a faithful attendee, supporter, and follower of Jesus Christ. Have you shared the importance of your faith with those closest to you, your family members, your children, your grandchildren? Maybe you can take a little time to write a letter filled with your prayers, your hopes and dreams, and your faith for them for their birthday. Now, they may not read or understand them now, but when you are no longer here, you can and will still be able to speak to them through what you shared with them. I have a question for you. 
what is Prairie Avenue Christian Church known for? It's always interesting for me to hear the first responses of those who ask where I work and what I do. And when I mention that I'm the pastor of Prairie Avenue Christian Church, I usually get these common responses. Where is it? Is Francis Romack still alive? I or my family used to attend. Oh, I didn't know it was a church. And I always give directions, 22nd and Prairie, south of Huck's, or the Old Sports Restaurant. I always say, yes, Francis is alive. And I always say the doors are still open to all alums. And I also say that, yeah, it does kind of look like an office building when you come up to it from the south. Most churches, I know, most people hardly think of the churches in their community. And most churches do not have an irreparable, awful, bad reputation. But what is worse, most churches have no reputation among unchurched people. We church people get all mixed up and twisted about style and theological arguments and how to reach and how to attract and the right kind of programs. But most unchurched people simply start to notice a church when that church and its members genuinely show care about them. And when they are actively engaged in seeking to have a positive impact in their community. When they see a difference being made, they notice it. It must be felt, seen, experienced, shining like lights in a usually dark world. I suspect by show of hands that it was a genuine care and active community service that drew you into Prayer Avenue Christian Church. Someone invited you. So why would you think that magically the minister is going to bring them all in? Participating and sharing in the life of the church was a taste of the world as it should be, a departure from the world as it is. What would our neighbors do if we engaged in such a way for them to encounter a world as it should be and not as it is? What community needs could we meet to change their world, offer hope? What difference could be made if we first sought the good of the other before good for ourselves? Because it's painfully clear that the world is not as it should be. There are gaps, there's brokenness, there's more. We are meant to push back and against the darkness of suffering, inhumanity, pain, loneliness, injustice, and poverty. We can make Decatur a better place. We can make East William Street a desirable one. And our church can move from the invisible building in the background to the visible hands and feet of Jesus. That would be what I would want Prairie Avenue to be known as. Our faith must be shared. And nothing is more captivating than a story, even your story. If you were asked to answer these questions, why are you a Christian? What do you believe as a Christian? And what differences does your faith make in your life? Could you answer them? I'm going to make an attempt to answer these. Why am I a Christian? Well, my first encounters with Christianity was in my grandmother's pew at the local Roman Catholic Church in Beemant, Illinois. My grandfather sometimes was in the pew, sometimes wasn't. He, he was raised Methodist, but we would always go get ice cream. And I remember at a very young age being presented Bibles and being asked to read. I remember my father often having an open Bible on the dining room table and reading and studying. And of course being a presence when we decided to join a church. I remember my mother. I remember the activities, the Sunday school teachers through the years and growing up in a congregation that affirmed my questions 
and didn't excuse them. That allowed me to grow and expand, to fall and fail, to succeed and to become. It was probably through that compassion, through that love, that I became a Christian. And that in spite of childhood and then young adulthood springing upon me, the tragic, unexpected death of my father, that family loved me and accepted me, warts and all. And I, I grew. Now, being involved musically helped, of course, but I desired to become a better Christian as I followed others on the same path. Now, what do I believe in as, as a Christian? It's simple. I believe that God came to redeem us and that the worst things in our lives are not the last things or the final things in our lives. That the worst we can do never betrays the hope I have in Jesus. That indeed, I hope to see him face to face in glory. And I'm a better person for my faith. I am a better giver. I'm a better community supporter. I'm a better family person, a husband, a hope, a father, a role model, a neighbor, a friend. We are closing our series with the familiar demonstration of what we are called to do as a group and what we are called to do as individuals. And our dominant hand put together reminds us that we as Prairie Avenue Christian Church members are witnesses, ambassadors of our church and are called to shine hope into the streets and places of despair all around us, just outside this sacred space. And the five individual fingers on our other hand are to remind us of the goal to share our faith with five people this year. You know them. Many of them are spiritual but not religious. Some of them may not even be spiritual. But the five are certainly not strangers. They are people who know you and with whom you may have some measure of influence. Someone whose life would be positively impacted if they came to follow Christ. It could be as close as your children or grandchildren or parents or even spouses, next door neighbors, co-workers. Do they know you are part of a faith life and belong to a church? And could they name it? You don't need to ask the embarrassing questions of, are you saved? You'll burn in hell otherwise. Any of those things. You do need to pray for them and let your light shine by your good deeds. Share your faith story with them at appropriate times and invite them to church with you, perhaps the easy ones, Christmas Eve or Easter Sunday. I tell you what, if you can share the latest TikTok video and latest cat or humorous animal video, then you can comment about your worship experience and insights from your church. You can share the photographs of serving others. You don't have to give judgment and there shouldn't be any hypocrisy and certainly no guilt. There are many names that come to mind in my walk of faith that came to me through people as well as words. My parents, Richard and Louise Butterick, the minister who baptized me, Reverend Bill, and my first Sunday school teacher, Helen Hudspeth, my middle school teacher, Phyllis Stroll, my friend and the woman who waited 30 years for an organist to arrive and it came in the form of an 11-year-old boy 
Evelyn and her beloved husband, Jasper Burton. Greg Romack, my high school teacher. I think there's some kind of circle about Buttericks and Romacks always being in faith together. The Reverend Frank Hotz, who spoke truth at my father's unexpected death. The Reverend Gary Crow, who reminded me that I was a child of God and I could be and do whatever God called me to be and do. And others. Who are the names that come to your mind? Will your name come to mind when others express their faith? Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the people you brought into our lives who brought us to you. Thank you for giving them the courage to live their faith in such a way that we saw it through them. Bless them for the blessing that they have been to us. And use me, Lord, as you used them. Let me be your light that pushes away the darkness. Let me be your witness every day. Let me be a fisher man who draws people to you. Let me be someone who allows others to see a reflection of you. Amen.